So I'd like to present first um, Jen Wilcox from Chemical and Biological Engineering Department at the Colorado School of Mines, and she's going to tell us all about direct air capture. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to start my talk off by telling you the five key messages that I'm going to present throughout. The first one is, is the energy of separation scales with dilution. The second one is to be effective materials and processes for direct air capture differ and are unique from conventional CO2 capture like point sources from coal and natural gas fired power plants. The third message is there's a broad range of cost estimates for direct air capture. And I'm gonna try and elucidate that a little bit for the audience. And then also direct air capture designs are inherently unique from a coal or, or gas fired power plant separation process. And so I want to talk about where that uniqueness comes from and how that's uh, developed. And then finally, to be considered negative emissions, uh, CO2 has to be stored on a time scale that impacts climate. And when it's coupled to utilization, the desired scale has to be on the order of gigatons to impact climate as well. So these are the five key messages, and I'll, I'll close with the same slide. So the first one is a pretty quick message. Energy of separation scales with dilution. So what this plot is showing on the right-hand side is the minimum work on the y-axis. The minimum work is simply that required to do a separation process. So if you have CO2 separation from air, this would be the minimum work associated with separating CO2 from 400 parts per million concentration. And as you can see on the x-axis, the CO2 concentration and that's increasing. And so you can see with direct air capture, if you're looking at say 50% all the way up to 90% capture and purities ranging from 80 to 99%, on average, the minimum work for separation is about 20 kilojoules per mole of CO2. And we can see that as you increase the concentration of CO2, say going from natural gas exhaust to coal-fired power plants to even gasification, that minimum work significantly decreases. And one might say, well, why don't we try and look at decreasing the purity, for instance, of the CO2 that we're trying to separate. But if you want to transport the CO2 in a condensed phase, say in a pipeline or a truck, then you have to pay a little bit extra in terms of compression costs. So you have to be careful in terms of how much you're willing to sacrifice that final purity. In addition, I think it's important to note that the bottom line is direct air capture should not be a replacement for mitigation. It's always going to be easier to separate CO2 from more concentrated sources. But the reality is today that we may not have a choice. We may have to do some component of negative emissions like direct air capture in order to prevent 2 degrees C warming by 2100. Now the next message is looking at the, kind of taking a little bit of a deep dive into the chemistry a little bit of direct air capture separation processes, because I know we have a diverse audience, and, uh, and not everybody understands how we actually do the separation process of CO2. And I want to show a little bit of why one can't take the technology that we learn and have adopted from conventional carbon capture from point sources to just directly translate that into direct air capture. So what I'm showing here is the Petronova power plant. And this is um, based out of Texas in the United States. And they have this tall scrubbing tower that captures about 1.4 million tons of CO2 per year. And this tower is about 115 meters tall. And if we dig into what this looks like a little bit, so on the left-hand side, what you see are these different stages. And those stages are stages of separation. So what happens is your flue gas comes in from the bottom of the tower and it moves through this bed of packing material and in the top you have a solvent, a liquid solvent. In this case, it's nitrogen-based or amine-based. And the key is, is that solvent needs to coat the packing material down the tower. And you're bubbling the gas from the exhaust of the coal-fired power plant up the tower. And at each one of those stages, the CO2 from the gas moves, moves from the gas phase into the liquid phase and chemically binds with the amines in that solvent solution. So what ends up happening is this solvent ultimately is saturated with CO2 at the bottom of the tower, and the gas leaving the top of the tower is free of CO2. 
And you can imagine that the more of these stages you have, the taller this tower is, the more carbon dioxide you separate. Now, there's a very simple equation. This is a flux equation. And this is showing that, you know, you can imagine that the higher this flux is, this is the flux of CO2 as it moves from the gas phase into the liquid. And the higher that number is, the better, right? Because you're able to process that CO2 faster and faster. And so the three components that really dictate that flux are on the right-hand side. The CI, that's the concentration of CO2 at the interface of the gas and the liquid. And that's dictated by Henry's law. So it pretty much says it's a thermodynamic quantity that says how much CO2 can we actually hold in the solvent. The second component is something called the mass transfer coefficient. This is really dictated by the process itself, how the liquid coats the packing material, the density, its viscosity, um, and, and, and the nature of the packing material. And then the final piece is, has to do with the kinetics. If you have purely a physical separation process and you don't have any chemistry involved, then you don't have that E term. But if you have chemical separation of CO2, which you need for direct air capture because CO2 is so dilute in the atmosphere, which we also need from coal-fired power plant exhaust, by the way, then you have an E component, you have a chemical reaction. Okay, and that has to do with that chemical kinetics component. And so this is just to give you an idea of the packing material, what that might look like that, that goes inside the tower. Now, um, this is from a paper we published back in 2014. And what this is showing is the partial pressure of CO2. So in the atmosphere, you can see it's probably, you know, it's around 400 ppm. Now, these lines here, these grid lines, are the concentration of CO2 at the interface of the gas and the liquid. The x-axis is the Henry law, uh, the Henry law quantities for all of these different types of chemicals that we use to actually do the separation process. So more interesting is to compare two examples. So in this left-hand side, we have direct air capture, and on the right-hand side, let's focus on coal-fired flue gas. So that's this line up here. And because the concentrations are so different, because coal-fired flue gas is 300 times more concentrated than CO2 and air, I put these on different plots, okay? And so what I want to show here is that for the same exact chemistry that we use to separate CO2 from the air compared to flue gas, this is the interfacial concentration. So for this kind of chemistry, or say an amine that has this Henry's Law coefficient, I bring it up to the DAC line, the direct air capture line, my concentration at the interface is 10. I take that same exact chemistry and I bring it up to the flue gas line and my concentration, you can see, is around 3,000. So this is a disadvantage of direct air capture. We're starting off with a flux that's already 300 times lower than flue gas. So we have to think about, if we want to capture, say, the equivalent amount of CO2, something has to give in that flux equation. You either have to have a Henry's Law coefficient or a material that is able to have a larger capacity, okay, or you have to have these fast kinetics. And so those are two of the things that can be potentially optimized. You can also think about how might the mass transfer coefficient be optimized, but that actually can't change that much. There's not a lot of flexibility in that. Next. This one I, I actually spent a little bit of time with because I feel like with the direct air capture community, it's the most controversial topic. There's this distribution of cost estimates and why. Why does that exist? So from the literature, and, and Sabina gave a, a couple of wonderful talks this week as well, and she shows that distribution ranging all the way from actually under $100 a ton all the way up to around $1,000 a ton. So how are we getting an order of magnitude span of costs and so I'm gonna dig into this a little bit. You know, Klaus Lackner and his group at Arizona State has developed a series of solid-based sorbents. So before I was talking mostly about solutions. But you can also imagine that instead of having water containing the chemistry, you can have a solid porous material containing the chemistry. And I'm not gonna have time to get into this today, um, but there are advantages to each of these, okay? And those are the two main approaches that we separate CO2 from air today. And so, the, most of these approaches are based upon actually using solid sorbents, 
to do the separation. But there's one based upon liquids, and that's carbon engineering. And so if we look at all of these costs and we see this large span, um, one of the things I want to point out is that there are different, when you think about separation of CO2 from air, you have to ask yourself, what do you want to do with the CO2 ultimately? And that's kind of the first piece of, of telling you how Klaus Lackner has numbers of less than $100 a ton. So let me show a couple of these technologies. So this is from personal communications from uh, Jeff Holmes at Carbon Engineering. Uh, and this is just an example of their air contactor. So they're based out of Calgary in Canada. And so what we're seeing here is, is their process is using a potassium hydroxide solution uh, that reacts with carbon dioxide to form a potassium carbonate. And, they, and that binding is so strong, they actually are doing a chemical swing. So ultimately, with that chemical swing, they're using a calcium hydroxide solution. So ultimately, the product that they're making is calcium carbonate. Okay, so that's, very, that's actually more thermodynamically stable than CO2. So after they produce that carbonate, they're in the business of making high purity CO2 for fuel synthesis. And so they need to actually heat that calcium carbonate at 900 degrees C in a calciner in order to regenerate the calcium hydroxide and produce high purity CO2. So that's what their process looks like. And I, I'm gonna get a chance to talk about that in a little bit more in detail. But the point I wanna bring out here is that they need high purity CO2 because they're using it as a feedstock for fuel. So they're interested in say, taking CO2 from 400 ppm up to 98% purity. Where Klaus Lackner on the other hand, is taking the CO2 and using it for algae cultivation. He's interested in purities of CO2 of between three and 5%. So taking CO2 from 400 ppm up to three to 5%. Turns out it's a lot less energy intensive to do that than it is to take it up to 98% purity. So you have you know, estimates in the literature of this process costing $200 a ton on average, and this one costing he, he sometimes says even as low as $60 a ton. But in fact, he might not be off the mark because he's only taking it up to three to 5% purity. And so if you're interested in kind of diving into these energy calculations a little bit more, we published this paper in e Environmental Research Letters just last year. And what this is showing um, is these are simple energy calculations. But this is the direct air capture scheme up on the upper left. And then we're also looking at uh, the minimum work associated with separation of CO2, again, from natural gas and pulverized coal combustion. And the span ranges anywhere from, you know, uh, single digits up to 20 kilojoules per mole, very similar to the plot that I showed you way at the beginning. And so what I want to point out here is for algae production, all the way down to 5% purity, if you want to have that as a feedstock for algae, you're in this little sliver right here, this light blue. And it turns out the energy to do that the energy to take CO2 from 400 ppm to say up to 5% is equivalent to the energy required to separate CO2 from the exhaust of a natural gas-fired power plant up to 95%. And we know we can do that for under $100 a ton today. We know that. So that means Klaus Lackner is absolutely spot on. Okay, so him quoting a number of around $100 a ton, there's nothing wrong with that because the boundary conditions are very different than some of the other examples. Uh, another common misconception is this concept of avoided CO2, or in our case, because we're interested in negative emissions, net removal. So one of the things I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about today is the energy pie. Why is it so energy intensive to pull CO2 out of the air? Now, it is energy intensive, quite energy intensive, because CO2 is so dilute and you need that strong binding solvent to do it. And if you're producing pure CO2, you need to add heat to regenerate the solvent to use it over and over and over again. Now, you have to ask yourself the question, you have fans and you have pumps in these systems, where's the electricity coming from? And the biggest hit is the thermal requirement to regenerate your material that you use for capture. So where's your energy coming from? Where's that thermal requirement being made? How? If you use natural gas, well, the natural gas, burning natural gas, emits CO2. And so you may not, if, if for instance, you know, if you even use natural gas, you might only capture about a third of the CO2 originally intended. It depends on how much energy um, your system requires. But it turns out that if you use coal as your source for your thermal, 
you generate more CO2 than you capture. And so it's really best if you want to maximize the negative emissions that you use carbon-free electricity and carbon-free thermal. So I want to give a little example. If we look at the, um, if we assume we have a cost of capture of about $200 a ton for operating and maintenance and capital, and if we use natural gas for the thermal requirement without co-capture, so what that means is you could design a system in which you capture the CO2 from the natural gas and you're taking the CO2 removal from the atmosphere. So if you're not doing co-capture, then your cost actually, you're only capturing a third of the CO2 intended, your cost comes out to $600 a ton. So some of those ranges that you see are people simply reporting avoided costs or net removal costs versus the cost of capture. And you can see, depending on what your heat source is, it can range from $200, $600 a ton. So you really just have to be careful in terms of understanding what they're reporting. And so these are some examples of how you can reduce costs. Co-capture of CO2 from natural gas and DAC. So carbon engineering does exactly that by using an oxy-fired kiln in order to regenerate that calcium carbonate that they produce that I talked about. Um, Climeworks is the first, first commercial scale uh, operation out of Switzerland. They use geothermal, so they're able to maximize uh, the amount of CO2 removed. You could also focus on other aspects like the time scales, kinetics, the thermal, how fast can you move the heat through the system, can you produce CO2 at a faster rate. Uh, those are ways to also bring down costs. And so I think a lot of people don't realize that what it takes to capture a million tons of CO2 from the air in a year is a power plant on the order of 300 to 500 megawatts depending on what your energy requirement is. And this spans all of those, except for Klaus's system, which is very minimal energy because he doesn't have to go to high purity. And so there's this common misconception that I see all, so many places, DAC, you can put it anywhere. It's not true, okay? So that's a misconception. You need resources to build a plant. To put a power plant anywhere is not necessarily feasible. And so you've really got to be careful about, you know, using those kinds of statements. And I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to skip through this. And I described this is um, the approach that's used at Carbon Engineering. That's the solvent-based approach with potassium hydroxide. But what I want to point out is that when you look at that solvent-based approach, the biggest piece of the energy is the regeneration. You have calcium carbonate, and you have to heat it to 900 degrees C. That's calcining. And the heating and drying, so that's 95% of the energy where the fan and the solvent pumping are a very small percent. This is a breakdown of the costs. And so you can see, um, you know, natural gas is a big component of the cost at 13%. And then also that, the, in their case, not yet commercially available was these oxy-fired calciners. So it's a very expensive unit to be able to do that. So that's where a lot of the cost comes from as well. So I want to give you this fourth message in that DAC is inherently unique with thin beds and large surface areas. And so this is what we often see, these very, on the right-hand side, you have these high surface areas with these fans that intake the air. And why are those beds so thin? And so this is an image showing that, you know, in one of those kind of modular units where you have this fan and you have the packing depth, well, the deeper you get, the more CO2 capture, right? You could kind of flip this and imagine it being that tall, thin tower, but it's not the case for DAC. And the reason why is the deeper you get, the more fan power it's required. Okay, and that's called pressure drop. You're overcoming pressure drop. So the beauty is the deeper you get, the more CO2 capture you have, and therefore the, last, the, the less capital you have to spend on this huge contactor. But then you're spending it a different way when you go deep. You're spending it on fan power, so there's an optimization. And so the red line is looking at the cost associated with the fan power, which just steadily increases as you get deeper and deeper. And then you have the annualized capital, which is decreasing as you're going with a deeper packing depth because you're not having to make the contactor as big because you're capturing more carbon by going deeper. But then you bring those two together to get the total cost, and you get this optimized well in the middle that says, you know, Packing depth is probably optimized at six meters, so it forces you to have a thin bed. And this is a description of that. If you're at a place where you have cheap electricity, like in the States, we have Oklahoma, 
you know, well, then maybe you can afford to go to a deeper bed, right? If you have carbon-free, cheap electricity. And therefore, it would m minimize your initial investments because you're not having to make such a wide contactor. So there's interesting cases um, where you can think about this. Okay, final message, and I know I'm out of time. To be considered negative, CO2 has to be stored on a time scale that impacts climate. And, and, if, and if utilization is to be coupled with direct air capture, it has to be on the order of gigatons. And again, stored on a, on a time scale that impacts climate. So if you think about converting CO2 from the air into a product, which is what all of the direct air capture companies are doing today, because there is no other incentives to capturing CO2 from air, so they have to make a, a useful product from it, whether it's fuel or, in this case, synthetic aggregates. So the steel market, if you were to take CO2 and convert it um, to, say, a carbon fiber and replace all steel, it only adds up to be about one and a half gigatons of a market. But sand and gravel is actually quite significant, and I know Phil is going to mention this in his talk this morning, too. And construction aggregates, for instance, on the order of about 50 gigatons in 2017. So you can actually make CO2 you know, into, say, a carbonate material and use it in this way, and the market's actually pretty significant. Then I just want to finally mention, there's all these other things that we can do with CO2, and this is a map of the U.S. And, and utilization opportunities, but this isn't CDR, so we shouldn't confuse ourselves. If we're turning it into a fuel, we're going to burn the fuel and it goes back into the air. Anything that's going to be oxidized on a short time scale is not really useful in the conversation of negative emissions. It's useful in the conversation of establishing a carbon market as a pathway forward, but not necessarily negative emissions. And so, with that, I'm going to not repeat my messages, but happy to take maybe a quick question or two. Thank you.